periods in the history of Marian apparitions. The first period, exemplified by the apparitions at Zaragoza and Guadalupe, is characterized by requests for a sanctuary of God, a chapel or a church, the occurrence of a miraculous healing, and reports of conversions to Christianity, or a deeper understanding of the ways of God. The second period begins at Rudebach in 1830. During this stage of the apparitions, the Virgin is now seen to weep, to pronounce prophecies and reveal secrets, warning mankind that it must return to God lest it face terrible punishment. The themes of prayer and penance become dominant strains in the messages, not merely for oneself, but more importantly for others as all humanity forms a cosmic spiritual body so that the sin of one infects all and the virtue of one extends grace to all. The Virgin begins to summon all souls to an imitation of Christ who suffered that humanity might be saved. France used to be referred to by the church as the daughter of Mary and it was to this nation that Mary first appeared in the series of what is referred to as her modern-day apparitions. Its capital, Paris, the city of life, has always been considered one of the most sophisticated centers of the world. And so it seems somehow incongruous to today's Catholic that this was chosen to be the site of the first modern-day Marian apparition. Among the city's many winding side streets is Rue de Bac, here stands the mother house of the Daughters of Charity, where Mary appeared to a 22-year-old novice named Catherine Labouré. A few minutes before the 19th of July, 1830, the novice was roused from sleep by a radiant child 
who led her to the chapel explaining that the Virgin had called for her. The girl then heard a sound she was to describe years later as the rustle of silk and a beautiful lady appeared and seated herself on the chair reserved for the father director. Filled with joy, Catherine flung herself at the lady's feet, put her hands on her lap and looked up to behold a mother's eyes. Years later she was to say that this was the sweetest moment of her life. The Virgin revealed that the good God wished to entrust the girl with a mission and that she was to confide in her spiritual director, give an account of all she was told, all she saw and heard, and what she understood in her prayers. Mary then disclosed a series of ominous prophecies, saying that the times were very evil, that sorrows would come upon France, the throne would be overturned, and the whole world would be upset by miseries of every kind. With tears in her eyes and in broken sentences, she continued, saying that there would be victims among the clergy of Paris, that the cross would be treated with contempt and hurled to the ground, that blood would flow and the streets stream with blood, that the archbishop would be stripped of his garments and that the whole world would be in sadness. But she held out the great hope of prayer. Come to the foot of the altar. Here great graces will be poured out upon all who ask for them with confidence and fervor they will be bestowed upon the great and the small. She also revealed that throughout the sorrow and danger, the protection of God would be present in a special way and that she herself would be there. Always I have my eye upon you. I will grant you many graces. Catherine seemed to understand that some of the events were to take place soon, but that the rest would occur even 40 years later. Father Aladell, Catherine's confessor, was very skeptical. But scarcely a week after the vision, the July Revolution of 1830 erupted in full fury. The attempts of Charles X to restore the monarchy and Bourbon absolutism to France was met by a fierce popular revolt, which toppled the king from his throne. The narrow streets of Paris echoed with a rattle of musketry and the cries of the mob that burned, looted and killed corpses lay everywhere. The church, which was perceived as a powerful ally of the monarchy, now became the target of the mob's wrath. Members of the clergy, whether guilty or innocent of advocating the return of absolutism, were imprisoned, beaten and killed. Churches were desecrated, statues pulled down and the cross trampled underfoot. The Archbishop Monsignor de Calen was forced into hiding. The terror of those days appeared to confirm the lady's words to Catherine. A second apparition occurred on the 27th of November, 1830. Again, Catherine heard the rustle of silk. Then the Virgin appeared over the high altar of the chapel, standing on a globe of gold, in all her perfect beauty, as Catherine would later recount. Mary was looking up and held at arm's length a golden ball which she seemed to be offering to God, on top of which a cross appeared, fleetingly. Her arms were resplendent with rings, three on each finger. They were bejeweled and of various sizes, and dazzling rays streamed from the gems onto the larger globe below. This time, Mary's lips did not move, but Catherine heard a voice, an interlocution, which said, the ball which you see represents the whole world, especially France, and each person in particular. The rays symbolize the graces I shed upon those who ask for them. The gems from which rays do not fall are the graces for which souls forget to ask. Then the ball vanished, and as Mary's arms opened wide in a gesture of indescribable compassion, there appeared beneath her feet a hideous green and yellow speckled serpent whose head she crushed with her heel. An oval frame began to form around the Virgin, and upon it, inscribed in gold, appeared the words, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. The voice spoke again. Have a medal struck after this model. All who wear it will receive great graces. They should wear it around the neck. Graces will abound for persons who wear it with confidence. The tableau revolved 
the Virgin disappeared and was replaced by a large M. A bar went through it and from its center extended a large cross. Beneath the M were two hearts, one crowned with thorns and the other pierced with a sword. Twelve golden stars surrounded this as in an oval frame. And then, according to Catherine, everything vanished like the flame of a candle that is blown out. The lady would reappear to Catherine, urging that her request for a medal be fulfilled. But in Father Aradel, Catherine met a wall of skepticism, and she trembled as she entered the confessional each time to confront him with the Virgin's request. At one point, Catherine, like Juan Diego, the visionary of Guadalupe, was so disheartened that she asked the lady to choose someone else to fulfill the mission, as the priest would not believe her. But Mary replied, Never mind, he is my servant, and he would fear to displease me. Father Aladell soon realized that his penitent did not have the genius for creative invention and began to believe in the authenticity of the vision. Though he did not wish to disobey an order from heaven, he felt he did not have the authority to have such a medal struck. Of paramount importance here was that the medal was to bear the words, O Mary conceived without sin. The Immaculate Conception, although having been the subject of much dialogue in the Church, had not become dogma. In fact, in 1830, the doctrine had not yet been promulgated. That was to come 24 years later. But Father Aladell had been shaken by the fulfillment of the Virgin's prophecies, and due to Catherine's persistence, he consulted the Archbishop, Monsignor de Calen, who, finding in the visions no contradiction to the faith, authorized the medal of the lady to be struck. It should be noted here that Monsignor de Calen was the same archbishop forced into hiding during the July Revolution prophesied by the Virgin. The first 2,000 medals arrived two years after the Virgin had made her request. Father Aladell spread the messages and the details of the apparition, but upon Catherine's insistence kept her identity a secret. By this time, Catherine had received the habit, and not even the nuns with whom she lived were aware that she was a privileged visionary. The propagation of the medal was carried out swiftly, and soon reports of cures, conversions, and miracles by wearers of the new medal flooded the convent of the Sisters of Charity. The first supply vanished rapidly. Even Pope Gregory XVI had received one of these and placed it at the foot of the crucifix on his desk. In no time, what was then called the Medal of the Immaculate Conception began to pour from presses in streams, spilling all over France and onto other countries. There were so many miracles attributed to it that the medal's original name was soon forgotten and it came instead to be known as the Miraculous Medal. By December of 1836, the firm of Bachette had sold several millions. Eleven other Parisian firms had equaled this number, and four Lyon engravers struggled to keep up with a great demand. In 1836, a canonical inquiry concluded that the medal was of supernatural origin and that the wonders it worked were genuine. Archbishop de Calen was so overjoyed that he gave free rein to his devotion to the Immaculate Conception and it was through his efforts that the invocation, Queen Conceived Without Sin, was inserted in the litany of Loreto. No sacramental of the Church had ever created such an impact since the Rosary routed the Albigensians and the Turks. None had ever been spread in such incredible numbers in just a few years. In 1842, a great event took place which brought the Miraculous Medal to the attention of the world outside the Church and resulted in the official recognition of the medal by Rome itself. This event was the conversion of Alphonse Ratisbonne, a 28-year-old scion of an old Jewish family of Strasbourg, a lawyer by education and a banker by trade. Truly a man of the world, he sneered at anything spiritual and was contemptuous of Christians. His bitter resentment over his brother's conversion and entrance to the priesthood developed into an intense hatred for the Catholic faith. But in Rome, someone dared him to wear the medal, 
and recite the memorare, and Radis Bone complied, intending to prove that it was all superstition. A few days later, while waiting for a friend in the side chapel of a church, he was a recipient of an intense mystical experience, and his friend returned to find him on his knees, tears streaming down his face. Rattusbone had seen the Virgin. She appeared exactly as she did in the meadow, with arms outstretched and rays streaming from her hands. He recounted that her face was of such blinding beauty and that her hands expressed all the secrets of divine pity. He immediately went to confession, received baptism, and then entered the Jesuit fathers for formation as priest. Years later, he left to form his own congregation for the evangelization of Jews and spent more than 30 years in the Holy Land as a missionary to his own people. Reports of the Madonna del Ratisbon and the sudden conversion of this avowed non-believer spread like wildfire, causing a major sensation among the influential circles of European society. Official inquiries by the church in Rome into the astonishing event resulted in the almost immediate recognition of the miracle of Radisbone's conversion through the intercession of the Lady of the Miraculous Medal. The Virgin's prophetic words on the travails of France and a world in sadness proved only to be too true. The violent events of 1830 were to reoccur. 1848 was a year of revolutions marked by a series of bloody Parisian battles. In the three-day Battle of June, the Archbishop of Paris, Monsignor Affray, died by an assassin's bullet on the barricades as he pleaded for peace. Karl Marx was in France to observe this revolution firsthand, and in that same year, together with Engels, he wrote the Communist Manifesto. In November of that year, the enemies of the church struck again. This time, the attacks were directed principally at Christ's vicar on earth, Pope Pius IX, who was forced to flee from Rome when a mob led by so-called liberals attacked the papal palace with the intent to usher in a new era for mankind, the glorious era of a redemption far different from that announced by Christ. Brother was to kill brother again in the dreadful carnage of the American Civil War that began in 1861. And nine years later, Prussia, under Otto von Bismarck, marched on France and successfully laid siege to Paris. On March 18, 1871, 40 years after Catherine's first vision of Mary, another revolution, which called itself the Commune of Paris, occurred. Integral to the ideology of the forces united behind the Commune was a virulent hatred of religion. The revolutionists were known as Reds, due to the red sash they wore as a badge, and many members of the mob were followers of Marx. Once again, the churches were desecrated, the Eucharist and holy relics profaned, the clergy either killed or thrown into prison. The ominous prophecies of the lady were thus to be fulfilled, most within Catherine's lifetime. Much of what the Virgin had said was for Catherine alone and has never been disclosed. However, what was revealed was the beginning of Mary's message to the modern world, a message which she continued to deliver, which reverberated from the isolation of Fatima and remains unconcluded to this day. Throughout her life, Catherine continued to be favored with other visions and apparitions, among which included the visible presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And she was also given the gift of prophecy and interior locution. She could at any time converse with the Virgin and hear her voice in her heart and mind. For 45 years, Catherine had faithfully cared for the sick and the elderly in a hospice established by the Daughters of Charity on the outskirts of Paris. When she became too weak for this, she was made portress of the convent. Only toward the end of her life did Catherine break her vow of silence and obscurity. And then, just to fulfill the lady's request that a statue be made depicting the Virgin offering the golden globe to God. 
However, it was to be completed after Catherine's death, for on the evening of December 31st, 1876, as she had predicted, Catherine passed away. In 1933, 57 years after her death, she was beatified and her body exhumed and found to be completely incorrupt. And masses are regularly celebrated, but no cameras are permitted within the chapel where the Virgin had revealed herself in all her resplendence. And in a glass coffin, under the statue of the Virgin of the Globe, lies the body of Catherine Labore, incorrupt and serene to this day. If within her lifetime, Catherine became aware of an entire world on the threshold of sadness, so too did she realize that as the Virgin had said, the protection of God was present in an ever special way. In 1840, the lady had revealed her immaculate heart to another novice of the Daughters of Charity and introduced a sacramental known as the Green Scapular. In 1846, yet another sister of one of their communities received visions of Christ holding a red scapular which also bore representations of the hearts of Jesus and Mary surmounted by a cross. And in that same year, Mary was reported to have appeared to two young shepherds in the mountains of La Salette. In 1854, Pope Pius IX solemnly declared the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, and in 1858, reports of another apparition began to spread throughout France, this time of a beautiful young lady appearing to an illiterate peasant girl from the town of Lourdes in the French Pyrenees a beautiful lady who called herself the Immaculate Conception. In 1871, at the height of the Franco-Prussian War, a beautiful lady was again reported to have been seen by four young children of a small village called Poma. And in 1876, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, just days before Catherine's death, the Virgin appeared at Pelevoisin, and healed a dying woman and requested her to promulgate the scapular of the Sacred Heart. Could all these have been the imaginings of overzealous minds? Can these all be dismissed by references to a pseudo-religious crisis? After all, practical minds point out that in times of stress, the lines between reality and myth tend to blur. Or could heaven have really intervened? A heaven that man had begun to ignore. For the burgeoning communist movement declared that the so-called social principles of Christianity were not only sneaking and hypocritical, but preached cowardice, self-contempt, abasement, submissiveness, and humility. And in the 1847 draft of a communist faith, written by Engels, the last question went thus. Do communists reject the existing religions? And the answer? All religions which have existed hitherto were expressions of historical stages of development of individual peoples or groups of peoples. But communism is that stage of historical development which makes all existing religions superfluous and supersedes them. Ratified and signed by the President and Secretary of their Congress. Soon, much of the working class, in its desire to better human conditions, embraced these beliefs and set the stage for communism to sweep across the world, bringing in its wake the abolition of worship, destruction of the temples of God, and persecution of the faithful. This, coupled with the publication in 1859 of The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, served to further widen the gap between mankind and God, for in it Darwin contradicted Genesis and seemed to render as superfluous the role of God in creation. His theory challenged many of the basic tenets of Christian belief, stressing the importance of scientific thought, and proved to be so influential that as a result, man had begun to elevate himself to equality with God. From 1830 onwards, Diverse accounts of a beautiful lady shedding tears over the actions of her earthly children were reported 